right, I think we are live here. So welcome everybody, good evening. We're just gonna give folks just a minute here to jump in. Hope everybody's having a lovely, let's see what's today, Wednesday. You know, we all sort of lose track of the day sometimes. <laughs> but um, this evening we're gonna be uh, talking about our research roadmap. Um, and it's gonna be facilitated by our Research Advisory Council. Um, if you're not familiar with it, our Research Advisory Council, or as we lovingly like to refer to it as our RAC, um, is a group of scientists, clinical experts, leaders of cutaneous lymphoma research, and patient advocates. Um, and they volunteer their time and their talents to develop and expand the research programs that um, the foundation offers and supports. So in just a minute here, I'm gonna turn things over to Susan Thornton, our CEO, and she will uh, introduce our speakers for this evening. Um, but for, before we get started, I just have a couple housekeeping notes for everybody. Um, if during the show you have any questions, uh, please use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. It says Q&A, and you can submit questions during the show, and at the end, as time allows, we'll be able to get to them. We typically have about 10 or 15 minutes for questions, so don't be shy if you have them. And if we don't get to your question, um, please tune in to our Answers from the Experts Live, which I'll give more information for at the end of the show. Um, just so everybody is aware, we will be recording tonight's event uh, so that you can watch it back at your own convenience if you'd like. It will be posted to our website within about a week or so of the show. Um, and at the end of the show, at about five minutes before we uh, wrap up, there will be a program survey that will show up on your screen. It'll just pop up. And if you wouldn't mind just taking a minute to answer, I believe there's four questions that really helps us. We really appreciate your feedback for the programs. Um, and I am going to give a thank you to our corporate partners and our individual donors. Thank you so much for your support. We certainly couldn't do these programs without you. So we are so appreciative of that. So with that, I am going to turn things over to Susan Thornton, our CEO. Hi, Susan. Hey, Hillary. Thanks so much. And hi, everybody. Welcome to our inaugural event to launch our research roadmap, which is really an exciting time for, for us. And um, I have three of our Research Advisory Council members with me this evening. Uh, what I'd like to do is um, just ask each of them, I'll, I'll run through what we're going to do tonight, a um, few opening remarks, and I'll have each of our panelists do a brief introduction of themselves. We'll talk a little bit about the history of research in cutaneous lymphoma. For many of you, I'm assuming this might be somewhat new and to a new area that you don't know much about, so we want to make sure to, to fill in a few of the gaps. Uh, some history about wh what the foundation has funded, then we're going to have a conversation with our panelists, and then we're going to talk about the roadmap, and then we'll wrap it up with some questions. So um, with that, I'm going to uh, bring on our wonderful, illustrious panelists, who I have the pr privilege and pleasure of working with on our Research Advisory Council. And I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves, just share where their institution, you can see their names and their institutions, but just where their, um, their institution, and then what brought them to cutaneous lymphoma and cutaneous lymphoma research? Because I think that's always interesting to hear a little bit about how people came into our crazy disease world. So I'll uh, start with Dr. Moskowitz because she's right next to me on the screen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan. Um, so my name is Allison Moskowitz. I'm a clinical investigator at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And um, my research focuses in cutaneous lymphoma, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, as well as systemic T-cell lymphoma and Hodgkin lymphoma. And um, I got drawn into cutaneous T-cell lymphoma really by one of my mentors that's also at Sloan Kettering, uh, Dr. Stephen Horowitz, who um, really inspired me to want to work in this area. Um, and I, I, you know, I really see it as an area where we have the opportunity to not only, um, eight, we're, we really need to develop new treatments, but we really need to focus on treatments and methods to improve um, your, the quality of life of our patients, because this is a disease that really has such an impact on, on your quality of life. Um, and so that's really why I've been drawn to it. Great, thank you. 
Dr. Mishra, you're next on the on my on my screen. <laughs> Oops, how come we don't have our audio? Oh, oh we're missing your audio, me? Anjali. Hang on a second. Can you hear me now? Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Rookie mistake. Sorry about that. <laughs> so I'm Anjali Mishra. I'm assistant professor of oncology at Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center at uh, Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. Uh, what drawn me into cutaneous T cell lymphoma was really by accident. We were actually working on figuring out a protein that uh, enhances immune system, immune functions in the body. And uh, we, by mistake, actually found that if this protein is turned on for a really long period of time, it causes cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. So by that mistake, you know, making that mistake, we discovered a mouse model of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma that is driven by this protein overexpression. And now since for past 10 years, it's really has become an obsession of mine to figure out new pathways that we can interrogate uh, to find new treatment for patients, you know. So we, I'm really at the cusp of translational research where we discover new proteins that are either got in the patient or are abundantly overexpressed. And we target it using inhibitors or pharmacological therapies. That's it. Thank you. Thanks. Dr. Choi, you're last on my... On my screen here, but not least. Thank you, Susan. So my name is Jay Choi. I'm an associate professor of dermatology and of biochemistry and molecular genetics at Northwestern. Um, I run a research lab devoted to the genomics of cutaneous lymphomas, as well as see patients in the clinic. And I run the Photophoresis Center at Northwestern. Um, I got interested in cutaneous lymphoma actually as a medical student. I was just really fascinated by the fact that a rash could be cancer and we couldn't tell the difference between someone who had cancer and who didn't have cancer. And I just thought that this was something that was really important in terms of biology and medicine. It's something I wanted to uh, learn more about as I got further on in training. My research is really focused on the question I get a lot in clinic, which is what's gonna happen to me? And so whenever someone asks me that, I can tell them what happens to the average patient, but I can rarely tell them what happens to them. And so my goal is to figure out what makes each of our patients different to try to make sure they get the right therapy for their disease. Great. Awesome. Thank you. And I think as everybody can see, each individual came into the cutaneous lymphoma world from a little different perspective and also focuses a little differently. But together, we are trying to figure out the answers that I think that all of us as patients have. So with a little bit of that, um, and, and Mike, I think we might have a little background noise. I'm not sure what is going on. Okay. Um, just as, yeah, I can hear you. Your mic's on. There you go. Cool. All righty. So um, as I said, I wanted to talk a little bit about the brief history of cutaneous lymphoma research so that we're all on the same page. I, again, have the privilege of having spent lots of time with all of these amazing scientists and researchers and hearing about the history, but all of you probably don't know much about this. So, um, you know, I think many of you may have heard the story where mycosis fungoides was named back in the 1800s by a French dermatologist, and he thought it was mushrooms growing on, on the skin of a patient, and, they, and so he named it mycosis fungoides, kind of mushroom, mushroom, which we haven't been able to get rid of the name, we're kind of stuck with it, unfortunately, but you know that was kind of the baseline of when cutaneous lymphomas came on the scene, if you will. And then in 1870, the staging and progression was outlined with patches, plaques, and tumors. And then, you know, not much happened really until Cesare was really found in 1936. And long time before the International Society of Cutaneous Lymphomas was organized and founded in 1992. So think about that was the first time that clinicians, researchers who were interested in cutaneous lymphoma, and I think at that time in 1992, there were probably 
a little more than a handful of people globally who were really specifically geared towards this disease. Um, and that, when you think about it, wasn't all that long ago. Actually, I was diagnosed in 1991 and my specialist who helped me in the first 15 years of my disease was actually one of the co-founders of the International Society. So, you know, um, Dr. Eric von der Heide was definitely a forward thinker. I was really lucky to be one of his patients, but, you know, that was the first time that the collective clinical community came together and said, let's put our heads together and try to facilitate what we know. And then in 2009, so then, you know, another number of years when the United States Cutaneous Lymphoma Consortium was created. So it's the subgroup in the United States. And there's also a subgroup in Europe that uh, collectively bring together the clinicians, researchers, students, scientists in cutaneous lymphoma. Uh, and then the foundation, actually, in 2009, we hosted the first ever cutaneous lymphoma summit which brought together a multidisciplinary group of people. We brought the, the physicians from all different disciplines. So dermatology, radiology, radiation oncology, um, hematology oncology. We brought together the nurses, plus us as patients. I was actually part of that program. Uh, and it was the first time all the different groups really came together and we had the clinical track and then we had the patient track and then we all had a really wonderful celebratory dinner in the evening which was really great um, and that kind of kicked off this idea of wow we should have a a congress right of cutaneous lymphomas where the researchers and the clinical community globally comes together so for the first time there was the cutaneous lymphoma global clinical summit. Um, and that was held, the first World Congress was in 2010 and um, in Berlin, if I have that correct. Um, so, you know, as you can see, these are milestones, but most, all of this has happened relatively recently. It's not like we have, you know, hundreds of years of researchers and scientists coming together to put their heads together to figure out what's going on in cutaneous lymphoma. So, Again, just to build a little bit of a context. And then where's the foundation where we played? So for many of you, you may be aware that the foundation was actually established in 1998. So if you put that into the context of um, 1992, the International Society of Cutaneous Lymphomas came together and then the foundation was formed in 1998. And then in 2003, we started supporting young investigators to these various scientific meetings where they were, we, it was a tra it's travel awards. We we're able to support them to go to these meetings, to share their work and their research within the collective clinical community, which is really powerful uh, for a lot of these young investigators to be able to present in front of their colleagues and so forth. Um, and then in 2005, uh, we supported the first ever quality of life research that was uh, facilitated and the research was done by Dr. Marie France Demier. Uh, sadly, she passed away way too young unexpectedly, but that was the first landmark study that pulled together all of our perspectives on how does this disease impact quality of life? And until then, we didn't really have good data around the quality of life aspects. And like Dr. Moskowitz spoke about, you know, this is a long-term chronic disease. It has a lot of impact on how we live every day, as all of us know very well. And, and that plays a very important role in, in looking at the larger research um, uh, ecosystem, if you will. And then we supported an epidemiology research uh, in 2007. Again, as I said, we supported the first ever multidisciplinary summit and we did a comorbidities research grant. Um, we funded a researcher out of Israel, uh, Dr. Emmy Hodak, who was looking at some um, interesting things about uh, within families. And then in 2012, we actually received a, uh, a bequest from the estate of a patient 
who wanted us to actually help to facilitate and fund research in cutaneous lymphoma. And up till that time, we didn't have, the foundation did not have any infrastructure for providing research grants where the scientists and clinicians could apply for money to support their research. So in 2012, with the help of our illustrious clinicians on our board, who was uh, Dr. Pierluigi Porcu and Dr. Stuart Lesson, created our Clarion's grant. And uh, this was Dr. Porcu's um, brilliant acronym, Curing Cutaneous Lymphoma by Advancing Research with Innovation and Offering New Solutions. So we launched our first ever research funding and there was uh, $25,000 grants that were given out to innovative research in cutaneous lymphoma. And from that grant, we learned a lot. We put some infrastructure in place. We put our scientific research um, review committee to review the grants. And we realized from the foundation's perspective that there was an opportunity for us as the patient community to really support the research in the field. So we were able to raise a little bit more money and we put together our research advisory council and we formed that in 2018. And you see three of our wonderful uh, research advisors here are joining us tonight. And we had several workshops where we sat down as a group and we had a very, we have a very broad spectrum of folks that bring different uh, viewpoints to the table and really hashed out what is the current scenario of research in cutaneous lymphoma? Where can the foundation play the most impactful role? What kind of uh, money should we raise? And what kind of research should we conduct in order to best move the needle forward? And what kinds of questions should we try to help get answered? So um, we launched our Catalyst Grant in 2019 and we've uh, given out, let's see, I will get this wrong probably, um, uh, four Catalyst grants and we just opened up our grant for this year. We delayed it a little bit because of COVID, but we are now open for uh, research applications for this next round. So that's kind of quick view through research and where we are and where the foundation is. So at this point, um, and this is our illustrious and wonderful uh, research advisory council. Not everyone is pictured here, but you get a sense of, of the folks. You can see Dr. Choi and Dr. Moskowitz and doc, Dr. Mishra, um, and now you have them live and in person. So at this point, I wanted to open it up and just have an open discussion and pick your brains a little bit and share with our, our patient community, you know, why, is this kind of why is this research so important in cutaneous lymphoma? I know I have my perspective, right? But I probably am a little bit jaded as well because I get to sit and listen to the science. But if you're speaking to a patient from your perspectives, why is this important? Anybody want to jump in first? Sure. Allison, <laughs> I can jump in. <laughs> I'm going to pick on somebody. I'm right next to you. <laughs> I know. Um, well, <laughs> I think that, um, you know, I, you know, when I, every single patient who is diagnosed with cutaneous lymphoma, which, you know, it may be more so than any other disease. And of course, I'm biased because I take care of this disease, but, um, you know, it has such a unique experience with it and have so such unique needs as far as um, how to balance treatment and the disease with their life. And, um, and, um, and so as a result, where it's, I would say that nobody's experience is the same. Nobody's, you know, ex uh, reaction to treatment is the same with regard to side effects. Um, and, um, and also, you know, we also don't always know which drug is going to be the rest, which treatment's going to be the right and the right treatment for that individual. And all of those things I wish that we had better answers for where often sometimes it's, a little bit of trial and error, um, and and sometimes choosing the right treatment based upon the conven convenience or where where somebody lives and whether or not they can come back and forth or whether they want a pill and you know and I think there's so much work to do to figure out what is the 
right, just like, you know, what Jay was talking about, you know, what is the right treatment or what, how do we predict what's going to happen to this individual and what, you know, what, how do we know what is the right treatment at the right time for them? Um, and we, we have a long ways to go for that. And, and I think that that's, you know, that's really where, where we need to focus. Yeah. So I, I see Anjali and Jay, you're both shaking your heads. And, and I know that Jay in the clinic, you probably hear that as well. I know those are the questions that I get too, is like, well, why can't somebody tell me exactly what treatment's gonna work for me and how it's gonna react? What What is it that we need to learn? Like, do you have some insights? Cause you're doing some of that kind of really deep dive type of research. Absolutely. I think that, you know, it's one of these amazing times where you can pick up the newspaper anytime you read about these amazing things that are happening everywhere. And it's all really based on the fact of really of decades of dedicated research. That could be anywhere from the COVID vaccine. It's amazing that we had it designed and basically built out within a year and now we're actually getting into patients. It's really a remarkable thing. And then a lot of my patients who I share with my other doctors who have melanoma, they're always amazed by how they have these special tests that will tell them exactly what's going to happen to them. What's their risk of disease progression? What's their risk? Uh, what's their chance of you know responding to this medicine? And we just don't have that yet for cutaneous lymphoma. I think as a society and as a community, we have to understand it takes time to build that knowledge. And that knowledge is really critical for making the advances later on, I think. Great, thank you, thank you. And Anjali, I know yeah. you have a little different perspective because you're really in the lab looking at, at the in-depth molecular, like how's this thing really working and what might be different? Yeah, so from my point of view, we are always trying to prevent cancer. You know, first step for us is really to find molecular clues that we can switch off or switch on to prevent progression of this disease. And CTCL as a disease is just so diverse, you know, and as it comes in several forms uh, in terms of skin representation and the organ it's located into and final stages of blood involvement. So uh, as a molecular biologist, we are interested in knowing what happens to these cells, why do they actually reside in the skin? Why do they choose to stay in the skin? And then at what prompts them to leave the skin and get into the blood or the lymph nodes and how we can actually prevent all of these events so that progression could be stopped. And uh, for that, we use you know several tools to uh, gather as much information as possible for translational research uh, and moving it forward to the clinics. Uh, so yeah, so for, for us, ultimate goal is really to prevent the disease. And the second one is to find newer treatments for the disease. Great, great. So, you know, I think one of the things that we did really well that I'm excited about within the Research Advisory Council is trying to bridge the gap from the research that needs to get done when you're looking at it from a, a scientific or clinical perspective and tying it back to the kinds of questions that the patients are asking, right? Because I, I think sometimes it's hard if you're a lay person to connect the dots from very complicated molecular, cellular kinds of um, research, but what does that research tell us when we're trying to answer questions from patients like, why did I get this disease? Or to your points, you were talking about, how do I know which treatments are going to work better for which people or which combinations of treatments? Um, kind of, why is that so important? to begin to understand and kind of peel that onion a little bit so that we can put it back together in the practical sense in the clinic. Hopefully that makes some sense. I don't know if any of you have a thought on that. I see heads nodding. Feel free to jump in. <laughs> 
Jay? So Susan, I think that for me, I think that it's really um, an amazing time. And I think that, you know, I, I show my residents all the time the pictures of cutaneous lymphoma and no two patients even look the same. But we have this really remarkable system where everyone is sort of treated the same because we have the same that have been around many, many years. And they're basically used um, in a way that's based, as Dr. Moskowitz was saying, almost on the preferences of the patient, preferences of the doctor. But we don't have anyone really good test to say, okay, this patient needs this medication, this patient needs that medication. And it seems like an easy question. You know, my patients always ask me, this should be easily solved. But actually to answer that question takes a lot of really, it requires a very careful look into the disease of what makes people different. Why do people respond differently to medications? And then how can we use that information to design new therapies? That takes a lot of research from the, from the era of clinical trials with the investigators like Dr. Moskowitz. It takes you know, a lot of effort at the molecular level and cellular level with preclinical models like Dr. Mishra and translational science like the work we do from patient materials to define the actual molecular circuitry that goes wrong differently in each patient. And it just takes a long, um, takes a long time to do it, but we actually have all these amazing tools to do it in 2021. So I think actually, you know, we're very close to solving these problems. I think we just need the right community. We need the right resources. We need the right, you know, opportunities to sort of band together to do it. And I think we, we can solve this actually very soon. Oh, so I'm very excited. Exciting. Yeah. That's really great. So maybe we go ahead, Allison. Well, I, I was I was going to say that um, with cutaneous T cell lymphoma, we actually have an opportunity to learn how, why drugs work or, or what are the best drugs to use for patients, primarily because the disease is so accessible. Um, you know, with other, with other cancers, it, it, you require a very, you know, potentially an invasive biopsy in order to look at the, the tumor under the microscope uh, while someone is getting treatment or after they are exposed to treatment. But, you know, one of the benefits of, of this disease is that we can do serial biopsies for people who are on treatments or on experimental treatments. And that's one of the keys that, you know, I think Jay's talking about, you know, as far as go, bring those back to the lab and analyzing them and trying to figure out what are the drugs doing um, to the lymphoma and how does that help us learn whether or not um, we're using the right drug at the right time. Wow. Go ahead, yeah. So so I, um, you know, uh, so your question was really, how did I get it and why this treatment is not working on me? So as far as, you know, how did we get it? Scientists have uh, figured out the aspect of the disease. And so we can conclusively say what genes do play a role in the progression of the disease. And, you know, geneticists, a beautiful work done by Jay, actually. Jay's lab had published really beautiful work on type of mutations that were found in the patients, CTCL patients. And as far as, you know, the novel treatments are concerned, I know that for the longest time, the patients were treated repetitively with the similar kind of drugs. But now, over the last 10 years, a lot more immunotherapeutic agents have come to the for especially in cutaneous T cell lymphoma, a lot more antibody therapies have come forward. I can only hope that in you know next decade or so we'll have cellular therapy available for cutaneous T cell lymphoma patients. And I think maybe ten year is just you know I, I am overestimating. Probably it will be available in next two years or so. And we are hoping that we can totally eradicate this disease once you get it, once you get treated, you're cancer free. So. You know, this is why uh, we are doing what we are doing in the labs. Wow, that's really exciting, you know, and maybe I can ask you then um, why from your perspectives and, and the different uh, ways you're each coming at research in cutaneous lymphoma, why is it important for the foundation to play a role in helping to support some of these efforts? And maybe you can speak a little bit about how your projects or overall projects get funded and a little bit about, you know, some of those challenges and why 
the, the funding that we can hopefully provide and grow to support some of these projects can really help to move that forward. If you have, if anybody has a, something they'd like to share, because I don't, I think most individuals I know for myself, I had no clue how all this stuff happens, right? I just figure, oh yeah, everybody gets funded and it's no big deal, right? And we have a big National Institutes of Health here and they give out all this money and everybody should, it should be easy, right? Any thoughts? <laughs> I guess I can start from a, from a clinical investigator point of view. Um, so I, you know, I get to, um, as a clinical investigator, I, uh, I run clinical trials, and some of those are sponsored by drug companies, which means that the drug company, um, you know, wrote the study and asked us to, to participate. And in that setting, um, the drug company is often, you know, is funding the study um, and providing us the resources to be able to pay our staff so that we can um, conduct the study. Um, the studies that I you know, personally, I, I am most excited about are what we call investigator initiated studies, which means that it's their ideas that, that we come up with, you know, the investigators come up with and we we present those ideas to the drug companies and say, you know, I, I like your drug and I'd like to look at it in this way, in this matter, potentially com combined with this other drug. And um, and those are the studies where we do have to have the, the drug company does have to agree to participate with us by allowing us to use their drug. And, and we often do ask for funding from, from the drug company if, if they're able to provide it, but it usually they're, those studies are usually underfunded. Um, and, and those are, those tend to be, you know, in my, I think a lot of us agree that those tend to be the, some of the most interesting studies because those are really ones that are coming from, um, you know, the investigators that are really, you know, taking care of the patients and, um, and, and from our own experience. Um, and, the, those are the type of studies that we're also, you know, as I mentioned, those, you know, we, we often do biopsies as part of those studies to try to learn why certain combinations are working or and how they're working. And those those are the type of uh, tests that um, we, we often don't have funding at all. And that's when we are looking for grants to try to fund the research so that um, so that we can learn the most we can from from these studies. Great. Um I can tell you from a lab perspective, when we do get an idea, we have to generate a lot of new data. We have to convince the peer reviewer. It's a long drawn out process, which easily take about a year to year and a half to get the money to the lab. And so, you know, we really lag behind in getting money on time to find potentially an innovative way to treat the disease. Uh, so that has been one of the major limitation for uh, for uh, for research work that we do in the lab, and I combine that with the rarity of the disease, where we do have samples. Samples could also be issues, and the models could also be the issues. So th there is a lot of limitation, but I'm amazed at the way people have moved forward with you know new research, and that's why we need more patients like you that are dedicated just to cutaneous lymphoma research. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I echo that. You know, uh, I'm sure Dr. Mishra does the same, but I, I spend probably about three or four hours a day writing grants. And it's because it's so competitive and it takes so long to get funded. And if you, um, it's just a real challenge. And so I think that most people in the community most people outside of our field don't realize how much time we spend actually trying to write grants. Now, the second part of that is that when we write grants to the NIH, they generally are very conservative. And it's because the, the Institute ha is, um, has limited money in its own way, and they try to give money to the sure things that's gonna happen next. If I give it to you, what's gonna be the next sure thing that you're gonna be able to provide or produce from the lab? What I see a foundation like Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation be able to do is two things. One is to really sponsor bold and brave ideas that will make, you know, big leaps in the way that we treat the disease instead of making small incremental advances, the kind of the ways that the NIH likes to fund. And then the second thing is we have an opportunity because it's based on a community of patients and physicians and researchers that the foundation can fund research that actually brings people together to share their resources, to think together and really use that to catalyze, you know, future research efforts. I think 
Foundations like the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation have really catalyzed research in leukemia, melanoma, other diseases because they represent the interests of the patient who are interested in like really bold, innovative ideas that will advance to therapies. They're interested in bringing people together to solve a disease, not for each person to get their own funds. And I think this is a way that the foundation can sort of lead the research direction in the future. Great point. We have a lot of work to do, but I, I, I'm really excited about where we are today in 2021. I mean, even just compared to when I was diagnosed in 1991, you know, there were very few therapies, very few individuals even working on the disease. Um, and I know, you know, it doesn't sound like really huge or a huge impact, but I think offering the travel awards for young investigators, when we look back at our history of the young investigators, um, and I'll, I'll go back one slide. This is a great slide, but um, many of the folks that we we gave a travel award early on have become some of the more senior researchers and clinicians in the field today. So off the top of my head, I think about um, Dr. Christian Querfield, Dr. Larissa Geskin, you know, just people pop into my head that they were one of our first round of young investigators, which is amazing when we look at them today. So I don't know if any of you have a perspective on the importance of supporting young researchers and investigators in the field and how that the, the foundation can continue to play a role in that through our research program. I don't know if any of you can speak to that aspect or if any of you want to. <laughs> I can do a little bit. So, so I think that, you know, okay, um, thanks, Jay. So a couple things. One is, um, you know, the young young people are always the uh, lifeblood of any kind of industry or field, and uh, no field will advance unless they have young blood coming in who have really new ideas and enthusiasm to build it. You know, in the research world and in the medical world, your early years you're actually very vulnerable. You don't have the um, reputation or the resources really available to more senior investigators. And so, it, you know, a small investment into a young person who's really fired up and really passionate about cutaneous lymphoma is actually, you know, a richly rewarding investment because they're going to spend the rest of their lives like actually trying to battle the disease like the people you mentioned, Dr. Querfeld and Dr. Geskin. I think it's an amazing opportunity to fund someone in an early stage through a vulnerable time in their careers. It can catalyze them to be really interested in doing research and really excite them and ignite the passions. And I think as for anything else, we need people to come through as young investigators to be the future leaders of our field. Yeah, I, I agree. Having had two of my physicians retire on me, um, I know it's really important, even though I know both were doing continuing to do research, which is good. But still, we need we need to keep bringing new people in the field and make it interesting and exciting and um, yeah, so I'm going to switch gears here just a little bit. And we spoke a little bit about this, but diving into our new research agenda and what the Research Advisory Council has recommended, we basically came up with these three pillars uh, of areas of focus. And, it, and I think the cool part is tying the, again, going back to the questions that patients ask and then tying the actual research components that can help to answer that question back um, in the kinds of research that we are going to fund. And I think that was a brilliant recommendation from uh, all of you, you know, basically saying, what are the main questions that we get asked? Well, why did I even get cutaneous lymphoma in the first place? And then being able to say underneath of that, how do we, what kind of research can best answer that question so that we're, we as the foundation and the funding that we will provide helps to answer those kinds of questions um, that are important to the people who are actually living with the disease. And I just think 
personally that this was a, a brilliant approach to be able to tie kind of the end user experience, right? Why did I get cutaneous lymphoma? What kind of lymphoma do I have? You know, what's my diagnosis and so forth? Um, and then how do I treat it best? And then the different components underneath of all of that. Um, I don't know if any of you have a perspective on how, how we are approaching that, but I, I really wanted to say that I think it's kind of innovative to be able to tie the two together because in my experience, even in the patient uh, organization arena with the other groups that fund research, they seem to be very, there's science and then there's the patient perspective. And I love what you all have recommended in for us to kind of pull those things together. I don't know if anybody has a, a perspective, but um, I really love the idea of this focus and then filling in those gaps and we can then share with everybody in the patient community how we're helping to answer those questions. If anybody has any, any feedback on um, that, I personally think it was brilliant. <laughs> yeah, it's really nice. I mean, these pillars that you have defined here, they look very simple when, you know, it's presented very simplistic model. But each one of these sections and subheadings are just, you know, work in itself. For example, understanding just the tumor microenvironment. There's, you know, team of researchers uh, that come together and study and dissect different cell types within the skin. There are almost, you know, more than possibly more than hundreds of cell types in the skin that play a role in harboring the tumor cells, you know, or keeping the tumor cells alive. So, you know, each one of these uh, study uh, heads are actually really important to address and uh, to move the needle forward. Uh, so I think that you're on the right track. This is, you know, a really good vision for future uh, research in cutaneous lymphomas overall. Great, great. Thanks, Anjali. And I just wanted to show everybody, now this, all of these slides came out of our new publication. I'm gonna to try to put this up here, our research roadmap. So you all, if you're on our mailing list, you'll get a copy of this document in the mail and you can read some of these things for yourself in a little more detail. And we'll be flushing out a lot of this on the website as well. But um, just to give everybody a sense of you know, we've really done a lot of work in a very short period of time with our research advisory council. And I would just open the question to all of you about, um, we're very grateful for the time and your expertise in helping us craft this and come up with the actual um, document that all of you will have access to here in the short term. But, you know, what, inspired you to give of your time and talent, um, not that you have any extra time, to spend uh, as part of our, our research advisory council. You know, that's a, we, we ask a lot um, of all of you and it's a lot of time and a lot of brain power. I mean, we spent, I think we had three full day workshops kind of hashing all this stuff out with everybody's opinions and things of that nature and, and I just, it would be great to hear from maybe each of you kind of why you would give of your time and and talent to help us and the value. Any um, any perspective? Well, I, think I, I, <laughs> I can start. Um, but I think you can probably hear from what all three of us are saying that we're we're very inspired and drawn to this area because of so many different areas where we can make, you know, where we hope that we can make some improvements. Um, and this, you know, it comes down to that uh, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma is a rare disease. And so um, we need uh, we need foundations like this. We need, um, you know, ways to get funding for research that are outside of, um, you know, the NIH prim primarily because, um, and outside of drug companies as well, you know, because primarily because this is a rare disease, it's not necessarily um, recognized by 
um, some of these um, broader organizations as an area of need. And clearly, we know that it's an area of need. And I think that, um, you know, by helping to develop these this research program, um, you know, we can address some of these areas and um, and, and really um, make you know improvements with in all the all the pillars that that you saw <laughs> and you know and, and i think you know the the pillars are really are um all of every part of the pillar i think you know even before you even got to the slide of the pillar i think each of us kind of touched on on different parts of that and and so it's just so ingrained on where we you know think there needs to be improvement so it's just it's neat to see it all laid out there in, in such a, a neat you know such a organized way but I feel like it, it really just summarized the, you know, the, the goals that each of the three of us have with regard to our research. Great. Anjali or Jay, anything else before I do my last and final question that I'm going to ask each of you to answer for me? <laughs> um, I, I would just echo what Alison had just said. Um, and, uh, you know, I generally don't see patients, so I have a different perspective about the disease. Um, uh, I just find this research really cool, you know, so I like to investigate what happens to the cancer cells, what makes them progress, what makes them go down in numbers, what makes them contain themselves, what makes them expand themselves, how do they become resistant to the therapy one, therapy two, therapy three, and what can we do that they ultimately, you know, die, these cancer cells. So. This is really interesting aspect of it. However, you know, funding is always limitation for rare disease. And uh, cutaneous lymphoma is unfortunately one of the rarest disease. And so we have to constantly remind ourselves that, we, you know, this should be our goal to collect as much fund as possible to continue this research. And that would ultimately benefit patient populations. Yeah, and put us all out of a job, right? <laughs> Maybe someday. <laughs> Probably okay. not in my lifetime anyway, <laughs> right? <laughs> so my last question to each of you, and I'm going to start with Jay, actually, because he's on the whole opposite side. So if you can look forward five years, what do you hope we will have accomplished from a research? What do you think, what would you envision us having done or learned um, and doing differently in five years from now in your wildest dreams? Well, I think, you know, I think actually everything that Dr. Moskowitz and Dr. Mishra and Susan, you have mentioned, I think actually can come true in five years. I think, you know, I often start every conversation with a patient say, we can control the disease, but there's really no cure for the disease. I think that could change in five years. It sounds ambitious, but I think it can happen. Mm -hmm. I also think that we can definitely in five years tell our patients what's most likely going to happen to them based on their disease type and their disease features. Mm -hmm. I think this is all within range. And I also think that um, my goal, I think one of the goals we should have is that if we have preclinical models that can help us to understand who and how things respond to therapies, we can make our clinical trials much more precise, efficient, and much better at predicting which therapies will actually work in patients. So I think in the next five years, I'd also like to see the foundation really fund clinical models, that preclinical models that actually predict what happens in patients. I think all three of these can happen in the next, three, in the next five years. And I think the CLF Ooh. can play a very critical part in all three. Great. Great. Well, you know, you're tagged to hang with us in the Research Advisory Council for as long as it takes. <laughs> <laughs> Anjali, how about you? What, what do you see in five years, hopefully? Uh, uh, I am hoping, you know, I actually have the same sentiment as Jay about it. Uh, I also want to see cell therapy move into Kitama arena. I know these therapies are expensive, but over time, perhaps they are going to, you know, become easily accessible, covered by insurances, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I'm hoping to see immunotherapy play a big part in uh, cutaneous lymphoma treatment. And um, along with that, I, you know, I want to get more clearer answers from molecular biology work 
what drives uh, you know inflammation in skin and uh, the quality of life improvement research is really critical for us to understand uh, so yeah i think it's going to be a really good amalgamation of uh, basic research translational research combine that with clinical outcomes that will be fantastic next five years excellent okay excellent how about you allison finish us up here um, well, I, I agree with everything that has been said, and, and I, I think that in the next five years, I, I think that our, our choice of therapy will be informed by um, some biological marker or clinical marker of our patients, you know, and, and we won't, we, we will move towards choosing therapies based upon what we have, you know, a good, a much stronger hypothesis or, uh, you know, pretty sure that are going to work and be the best, most effective treatment for individuals rather than um, do it choosing treatments fairly empirically, which is what for the most part we're doing right now. That's great. Wow. Yes, better days ahead for all of us. And um, really, all of you, thank you for your work, for joining us and helping us to work together to move things forward. I am excited to see where we land. We'll redo this in five years and see what happens. <laughs> we'll play the little clips from this, this presentation and, um, and see how we do, right? But I, I'm oh, really great. grateful to you know, all of you for spending the time with us. Uh, Hill, I don't know if we have any questions from our audience that we wanna take a shot at in the last couple minutes we have here. Yeah, we actually don't have any questions, so I guess that means you've answered okay. everything for everyone, but we do have just two brief notes. We have one um, that says a simple thank you from the board of directors for all of these amazing doctors for what they do for their patients with CTL, uh, CTCL and their time today. And then we also have one that says thank you for giving us hope for the future. We are all living with a very difficult, non-curable cancer, and it is inspiring and gives us hope to endure treatments for a hope for a cure in the future. We appreciate you and your research. And one last one, nice job panelists. Good to know we have younger researchers coming up the pike. So just again, <laughs> echoing Susan's thanks to you all. <laughs> yeah, thank you all. And I can't wait for you know, COVID to be over so I can get to, we can get all get together again and uh, continue to move the needle forward. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for, again, your time, your energy and your passion for uh, the patients and all of us that are living with cutaneous lymphoma. So thanks so much. We're gonna sign off for tonight. I know Hillary, you've got some announcements, I think before we um, close the book. You just Exactly. Yep. Okay. Um, just before we go, just if anybody does have future questions for us, we will be hosting um, an answers from the experts live on April 21st at six o'clock Eastern time. So we will be joined by Dr. Madeline Duvik as well as Dr. Richard Hoppe. And um, this uh, let's see, Thursday, March 25th at six o'clock Eastern time, we will be hosting another research focused program. Um, and that's going to be hosted by Dr. Oleg Akalov with the University of Pittsburgh. So thank you again for everybody joining us. I'm going to launch a quick poll here, if you wouldn't mind just taking a second to give us your feedback. And like I mentioned at the beginning, if you do have um, the urge to watch the program again, you can feel free. It'll be on our website within about a week of, um, of it airing. So with that, I think we're going to sign off. Thank you again to everybody for joining us tonight. We appreciate it. We appreciate your time. Be well. And as, as always, let us know how we can best serve you. And we hope to see you at a program in the future. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening, everyone.